thank you for all the especially your word and your teachers that are here to teach us. And then we'd like to raise up Pastor James and his family as they're getting ready to quarantine or out of quarantine with illness. We also want to pray for uh, Greg Curtis, Lord, that uh, you would uh, put your healing hands upon him as well. Uh, again, pray that you would uh, open our hearts and minds and help us to learn more about you that we can be better servants. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you. We are going to finish Luke chapter nine today. So if you'd like to Turn with me to Luke 9. That's where we're headed. These are long chapters. If you look at all of chapter 9, there is a lot of paragraphs there, a lot of material there. And uh, if you're joining us, I know some of you guys have been in a, uh, another community group. One of the, um, it's hard really to wrap this into one, one idea, but <clears throat> one main point that, that took place uh, that I think would be a good marker for us is after the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus asked who people said he was, and uh, they mentioned Elijah, one of the prophets, uh, John the Baptist, uh, and he then turns the question to the disciples, who do you say that I am? And the answer was uh, Peter saying the Christ of God, right? The Messiah, the one foretold, the anointed one. And uh, Jesus affirms that answer, but then he completes the answer. If he's the Messiah, he must go to the cross. Look at what he says in verses 22 and 23. The son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. So Jesus wants him to know as the Messiah, he must accomplish these things. That's what he came for. But then he takes it a step further in the next passage. He says, if you're going to follow me, you're also going to take up your cross you're going to lose your life in order to gain it just like i will do now it's not like we you know accomplish salvation through this in any way but what he's saying is you know a servant is not unlike the master you will have to follow me in the same way and it and and that's um part of following jesus instead of having jesus follow us right in our lives we often want to conform we want God's will and Jesus leading us to conform to our plan. We want Jesus to go with us wherever we lead. He says, you're going to have to follow me. Now, in losing yourself, in losing especially your sinful self, that's how you're going to gain life. That's how you're going to gain in Christ. So that's part of following him. And today, we're going to be looking more about what it means to follow Jesus. Um, then there was that Mount of Transfiguration experience, this another uh, confirming of who Jesus is, that Moses and Elijah are there because the one they spoke about in throughout the Old Testament was this anointed one, this Messiah. So the Transfiguration is another confirmation that Jesus is who God has called to be the Messiah. And so that point is very important. And then um, after that, we talked about the four mistakes that we often make when we're following Jesus. Um, with this unclean spirit, the disciples could not get, get rid of this spirit that the, the boy had. Well, the, the part of the problem was we find from the other gospels, they didn't have faith. They had little faith. 
and these can, he said, the spirit can only be um, taken out by prayer. So faith and prayer, they were not trusting God as they wanted to remove this spirit. And so they were trusting their own strength instead of through faith and prayer. The second thing that we talked about as a mistake is taking our eyes off the cross. Jesus again foretells his death. He tells them again, the son of man must die. But all these negative things are discussed, right? They did not understand. It was concealed from them. They did not perceive it. And they were afraid to ask him about it. Four things that were, in, in essence, them taking their eyes off the cross. Um, and we have to be careful in our Christian walk to get diverted from that. And then the, the third thing is, <clears throat> we are not very humble. And so when we are uh, going along the, the walk, sometimes we seek the glory for ourselves. Who is the greatest, right? This, um, um, I, I thought was so funny. I mentioned it last week. I still can't get over it. It was the dumbest argument ever had in human history. Which person is the greatest? Because we're not the greatest. And so that's something that, that we struggle with is seeking the glory for ourselves instead of for Christ. And then the fourth one is fighting the wrong enemy. Do you remember that? They are concerned because someone else that's not one of them is getting, is to, uh, exercising a demon with Jesus' name. And so Jesus kind of warns them, look, remember who the enemy is. This man is not your enemy. The evil one is our enemy. So be careful not to fight someone just because they, they have some different particulars that are maybe hard for us to take. They, they do it a slightly different way. And sometimes we have a hard time discerning what are the major things that are a point or not. So that's a little bit of a review. And now we're up to verses 51 through the end of the chapter. So let's read these together. When the Jays drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. And they went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. To another, he said, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. So this is our section for today. And uh, I want to start with that first verse, 51. Luke tells us Jesus set his face toward Jerusalem. And if you look at kind of the broad picture, you can tell what this is talking about, right? We look at the overall picture of the gospel, and Jesus now is setting his face towards Jerusalem. That's where he needs to go. And there's still several chapters to go before he's um, going to be uh, betrayed and before he's going to be tried and before he will bear the cross. But already you can see he has a focus. He has his face set, right? That's uh, indicating resolution. His mind is made up. He is going to do this. And, and I guess you could say there comes a time in our life where sometimes we've, we've got to make a stand, right? We have to make a decision. We have to set a goal. Uh, but this one is, it's not that he didn't have this resolution from the very beginning, um, and we, we even read of that throughout chapter nine. But at this point, there seems to be kind of a direct line of what Jesus fixed purpose is. And it really is kind of an echo of what we read in Isaiah chapter 50. I think this will be a, a familiar verse to you. 
but I want to read it just because I think it's neat to see how this is so fulfilled. And so if we read um, in Isaiah chapter 50, there's um, a section here about the servant, right? Um, and if I, I don't want to read the whole passage, but I, I'm trying to find out how to um, not just jump in the middle of it. Um, I'm going to start at verse four. So Isaiah 50, verse four. The Lord God has given me the tongue of those who are taught that I may know how to sustain with a word him who is weary. Morning by morning, he awakens. He awakens my ear to hear as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear and I was not rebellious. I turned not backward. I gave my back to those who strike and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I did not hide my face from disgrace and spitting, but the Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. I think that just gives you a sense of what, um, I mean, this sounds like Jesus speaking, doesn't it? it? It's kind of like, man, that could have been Jesus speaking in, in the book of Luke, right? It's just that clear, especially when you read that in context. But the Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. So that part is just a um, precursor to what Jesus does in verse 51. He sets his face to go to Jerusalem. Now, it does indicate that he's uh, doing this for a specific purpose. And if you look at verse 51, it says, when the days drew near for him to be taken up. And taken up could be considered like, I guess you could, you could look at it different ways, but I think the best translation of that really is most similar to the ascension, to him being taken up. And so Jesus has more than just his suffering in mind. And I think that does us well too. Um, when, when we think about Jesus suffering, uh, it can be, I don't know how to say this uh, exactly right, but it can be almost like we think of his death as that's it. And if you think about it that way, it, it can lead you to think of just him being defeated instead of him defeating. And the same thing can be true, I think, later on when we th think about following Christ. So if you just limit it to Jesus' suffering and death, sometimes we don't see the victory. But when we think about he's looking through that also to his glorification and what what a different view that is right so i want to make that point because i think this verse makes that point and i think it's helpful to us as we go through the rest of the passage so he's set on this and there is some ascension language in there but what happens immediately after that and he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. He's, he's going to receive a couple of things. One is opposition, uh, but another one is in the form of, we don't want you, <laughs> right? And we see that from, from Jesus' birth even. There was no room for him. There was no place for him. When people know what he's about, they, they still don't even accept it. And so there's always that little thread throughout these passages that even though Jesus is accepted by many people and, and, and in many ways he is received, there are also many times where he's not. The people did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. And that can kind of have a couple of meanings. I think one of them is we know the feud between the Samaritans and the Jews we know that the Samaritans did not want to worship in Jerusalem. Mount Gerizim was where they worshiped God. They had mixed their um, Jewish uh, rules and customs with other customs that were part of their lives. And so there was kind of that, well, if, he, if he's on his way to Jerusalem, we're not going to make it easy for him. Like if he's going to come through Samaria, we're not going to give him the the pleasure of doing so, right? There's that, that undertone of that, if, 
if Jesus is going to Jerusalem, then we are not going to help him because of that. And so in this case, the, the Samaritans don't welcome him. And we know that, that it's also, I think in some ways we see how Satan also is always trying to put little obstacles in Jesus' way. There are always temptations to maybe try to do it a different way. And I think you could look at it that way too. Maybe there's some spiritual darkness that is trying to um, make it a little bit of an obstacle in Jesus' way as he goes to Jerusalem. But you can see James and John are not going to have it, right? They're offended for Jesus. They're indignant. And if we look at it that way, it seems kind of like we feel good for them, right? At least they have some zeal, right? Even if it might seem misguided, at least they're on the right track. You know, they want to help Jesus. And it seems like they've got a lot of confidence, right? They have faith that they could probably do something about it if they wanted to. And um, so they're ticked off. Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? And it's pretty, um, I guess you could say, uh, sometimes people will use the, the phrase, you know, they're going to go Old Testament. On it. <laughs> right? It's, it kind of rings of fire coming down. Uh, we just think of different Old Testament passages where the wrath of God it, it comes down in fire. It comes down in judgment. Um, but if, you know, we want to see their zeal as a positive, what we can see as a negative is lack of charity, right? And that is a, a challenge for Christians, I think, that we can look at, is that our zeal sometimes is the first thing, and our charity is second place. And Jesus is, I think, rebuking them for that reason, to say, this is not the time for judgment. You know, these Samaritans will be judged when the time is there, but now is the time where they can repent. Now is still the time for them to be saved. And so in general, what should our uh, temperament be towards people who are unbelievers or are saying the things that they do say about God, that they say about Jesus in ignorance or in unbelief? It should be one of charity. We don't need to... Uh, we can still defend the name of Christ, but we can also do so in a charitable way. I want to read a quote from J.C. Ryle, and um, his name has come up to me so many times <laughs> in the past yeah. year, um, and uh, every time I read something by him, I tend to um, really appreciate it, and, and it's a good time to to ponder things. So he says this, it is possible to have much zeal for Christ and yet to exhibit in most unholy and unchristian ways. It is possible to mean well and have good intentions and yet to make most grievous mistakes in our actions. It is possibly to fancy that we have scripture on our side and to support our conduct by scriptural quotations and yet to commit serious errors. It is clear as daylight from this and other cases related in the Bible that it is not enough to be zealous and well-meaning. Very grave faults are frequently committed when, with good intentions. From no quarter, perhaps, has the church received so much inquiry as from ignorant but well-meaning men. And so I think his point is, is a good one, is that, you know, we sometimes defend what we've done, and I, I know I've done this, by saying, well, it's true, yeah, what does that mean? That doesn't speak about motives at all, does it? To say that was true, or they had it coming, or I quoted the Bible, right? I, I quoted the Bible here. What could be wrong about doing that? The Bible's always right. And that, again, doesn't speak to where my heart is coming from. So I can find uh, examples in my life where this would have been better. And in Proverbs if you read Proverbs, you're going to see different Proverbs that, that say things about that, right? Like one who vents can really spew a lot of things, but the wiser thing to do is to hold it back and, and to, to use better judgment. So I think that, that that's something we can hold on to a little bit here from this passage and to ponder in our own lives. Uh, he rebukes them. 
and they went on to another village. I do want to pause, as is my custom, before we go on to the next part. Um, I have one little thing to add to it, but I want to pause just to see if there's any other comments that you have or questions you have from this section. Anybody? I'm just going to throw this out. Maybe somebody wants to comment on this. Maybe I was wrong. But I had an interesting discussion with my brother-in-law all that two summers ago back east. And he was very offended. He's a very good Christian. He was very offended by a car that had a bumper sticker on it that said coexist. It had all these different signs, which I find that so offensive. I said, but what do you do with the travel about the wheat and tares? Aren't we supposed to coexist with the tares? And so we had a good discussion about that. And I, and, and I think maybe what you're saying is something like that. Yeah, I mean, I think I think you're you're going to need a lot of wisdom mm -hmm. to carry this out properly. Don't don't you think? I mean, that is the the one of the biggest challenges for Christians in this world uh, to know how to exist with fellow Christians and with people that are not Christians and knowing when is the right words and the right severity, that, that is difficult. And, and, and I know my fault is I always fall back on my own wisdom and that's the wrong answer. <laughs> Pausing for prayer would be a very good start, wouldn't it? And, and that's, that's, you know, humbling because it's, it's so important to remember that. I think it's way easier to, to to say this is what we should do or whatever, and then to actually practice it uh, is is very very difficult. But you know that's part part of sanctification and God's work and His Spirit being stronger in our lives and continue to read the Scriptures to be informed and and uh, and help each other. You know, um, be gracious with one another, but. Uh, I think in all of our dealings with people, we've apologized afterwards, and and we understand that there's need for that. John? Yeah, that brings up the thought of, of, for me is that you do something wrong, you keep calling your offended. Uh, one reaction is to shut up and take it, but is that always the right thing? Do because there's something that sometimes you need to speak up and but the question is how you do how do you do that wisely to rebuke someone or to challenge them. Yeah, and I think especially in this passage. Yeah, in this passage, especially, you know, they wanted to to come down in judgment. Yeah. Yeah. And that certainly is a with an unbeliever, that's not our role to practice judgment on them, right? right. And even with a believer, we're, we're not trying to exact judgment, but we're, we're probably going to be a little stronger. And we see that with Jesus, too, amongst the Pharisees. He's a lot more direct, and he does not you know, want his father's house to be a place of robbery and money-making. So I think those are important things too, to, to discern through it. But I think especially in this case, they, they want to do exact justice out of their zeal and use, you know, use power to correct them. And what's kind of neat is that in Acts chapter eight, John and Peter are in Samaria. And, and so I'm just going to tell you a little bit, like if in Acts chapter 8 at verse 14, it says, Now when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them, that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for he had not yet fallen on any of them, but had only been but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then it goes on, and, and in verse, I think it's... Um, 25. Now, when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. It's just neat to see that this same John, uh, he goes back to Samaria and he's not calling down um, fire on their heads at that point. So it's kind of neat to see that too. Uh, let's go on. Verse 57. 
as they were going along the road, someone said to them, I will follow you wherever you go. And I think the word follow here is the one that we are looking at. And I, that's why in our um, earlier just review, talking about following Jesus. And this section definitely refers to what people may deal with as they follow Jesus. And there's three examples that we have here. And you'll see each one, either Jesus talks about following him or these people actually say that they will follow him. Um, so we're going to look at what these situations are like. Uh, the first one, we could say that when we follow Jesus, we may have to give up the comforts of our lives, right? We may have um, times. So we're going to be looking at three things here. Following Jesus may mean I'm just putting them in here to kind of help give you guys a, a reference point on each of these. So he says, I will follow you wherever you go, right? And Jesus wants to make sure this person is aware what that means. Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head, right? This is to say, look, you can follow me, but as we go, even, even me, the son of man, even the, the Messiah doesn't have a place to really call home. I'm, I'm on the road. And, and are, you, is, are you willing to follow that way, right? The question is, will you follow wherever I go? Will you do this in a way where you accept that as God's plan for you? Have you ever heard that phrase, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for you. Mm -hmm. Well, Riken changes it. He says, I have love you and have a difficult plan for your life. That would probably be more accurate. Mm -hmm. So that's the question. You know, are you willing to follow a, a savior who mm -hmm. loves you, but it may be difficult, right? And what is that going to mean to you? Are you willing to do that? And what kind of comforts could this be, right? Are you, I, I guess I think about a job negotiation. You kind of are trying to look for, okay, well, what's my vacation time? What's, what are the benefits, right? That's one of the most important parts of, of the job application for a lot of us is, okay, I think I can handle the workload, but I want to know what do I get in return? And that's not how the agreement works with the Lord right? It's, it's, are you willing to lose yourself if that be what's required? Not everyone may have to leave their home. You may not have to leave the comforts of running water in your life. It's not saying that you will have to be homeless as a Christian, right? It doesn't mean that these things are evil, that, that you shouldn't own a car, that you shouldn't be able to have some of the comforts in your life. But what is going to come first for you? In following Jesus, are there are there things that you would put as conditions? And that's what Jesus is saying here, because that's not how it works. That's otherwise those things get in the way. Let's look at the second example. He says to another, he said, "Follow me," but he said, "Lord, let me first go and bury my father." So right away here, we see in this second one, there's, there's a, a level of priority, right? Um, he says in this one, following Jesus means there's no time to lose. Um, I think a lot of people in their Christian lives, and I, I think I said this a little bit before last week, perhaps, it's kind of like that moment of justification is like, okay, I believe in Jesus to take away my sins. And we sort of want that to be the end and the staying point of our Christian life. Good. I'm saved. Whew. But the question is now, what are you doing after that? Right? 
And so now Jesus is saying, okay, if that has happened, how do you know? Like, how do you know you really trust him? Well, you follow, right? How do you know you really believe that these things are true and that you're going to now have a life free from sin? Well, you're going to have to start walking to, to see what that's like, right? Do you really want a life free from sin? Or are you like, well, I want to first get a little further down the road. Like, I want to, I'll take my Christian walk seriously after college. Or I'll take my serious Christian life seriously when I'm maybe 30 or maybe 40, right? It's like, I'll, I'll get to that later. Let me first bury the dead. And one thing that is good to think about in the context is it's probably not like this person's father died just that day. It's probably not. Like, if that were the case, this person probably wouldn't have been around Jesus at all because their custom would have been to bury that body the same day, day 24 hours for sure. So in all likelihood, this person has an elderly parent or a parent, and the idea is, well, I have this responsibility to my parent. After they die, then I'll follow you. That's probably more accurate. It's like, look, I will follow you, but I have priorities first that I should take care of. I have earthly things that I should wrap up first, you know? And so is your God going to be to seek wealth until you kind of get enough money? And then it's like, okay, now I'll live a life that follows the Lord. But before that, I better get what I need for me first, right? Or even in, in the way we treat relationships, you know, if, if somebody wants to get married, sometimes they'll compromise things because they're like, well, look, I want to have a spouse. I want to have somebody that makes me feel happy. And I've got, so I'm going to complete these parts of my life. But following Jesus isn't something I'm doing while I'm doing that, right? It's sort of like I have these benchmarks in my life that I better take care of first. So when, there, when it comes to following Jesus, we have to be willing to do it ahead of those other things, that that's going to be the priority. And all those other responsibilities that we have, they're being done along the way. But following Jesus was the, was the plan that, that is carried through while we do it. And I think that is the part that Jesus is trying to uh, make a point about. Let the, and his remark is, is kind of, it, it's, seems quite flippant, right? He says, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. And I think what he's, what he's saying here in this context is, look, there are, there are plenty of things that you can do before you follow me. But what is that really? All of those things are unbelief. Those are spiritually unregenerate thinking. Like that's what that is. Like it, are you, do you really, really want to stay in that camp? Do you want to stay among the dead or do you want to go among the living? You know, new life in Christ is, should be the goal. And if you're not willing to step out or leave that way of um, what we would call the old person, the, the, the life that doesn't lead to eternal life, then you're just going to remain in your unbelief. So it's kind of like, look, you can let the unbelievers bury the unbelievers, but follow me now, right? Um, preach the, proclaim the kingdom of God. Make that your first priority um, in this case. Let's go on to the next third part. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Now, this one we're going to call don't look back. Now, this kind of uh, example, does it, does it kind of like make you feel weird? What, it, what, is, what is the part of this third one that makes you kind of go, that seems a little bit contradictory. Can you think of an example in the Bible that would seem to contradict this? Is there ever an example of someone in the Bible who was plowing and got called to follow the Lord? Elisha, right? And if you think back, you wonder, did Elisha do it wrong? 
Do you remember the example of that? I think it's in 1 Kings 19. And I think it's worth just looking at. So 1 Kings 19, Elijah goes to Elisha. And if we go towards verse 19, I believe, we read this section. So he departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen in front of him, and he was with the 12. Elijah passed by him and cast his cloak upon him, and he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, let me kiss my father and my mother when I, then I will follow you. So it sounds almost like the same thing, right? And he said to him, go back again, for what have I done to you? And he returned from following him and took the yoke of oxen and sacrificed them and boiled their flesh with the yokes of the oxen and gave it to the people and they ate. Then he arose and went after Elijah and assisted him. So it, it seems a little bit different to, for Jesus to say this when El, Elisha asked the same thing pretty much. Let me kiss my father and my mother and then I will follow you. And the, the way that I think we, we can look at this is a couple of ways. One is that Jesus, Jesus knows the condition of why and what is at stake here. In other words, in Elisha's case, there was no question of whether he was going to follow what he was going to do. I mean, he was, he was taking on this responsibility. In fact, so much so, he was going to sacrifice these oxen in sort of a praise offering or whatnot. Hard to say exactly, but it's kind of gives you the sense of like what they would do for thank offerings where they would get to feast afterwards. Whereas I think in Luke nine, Jesus is saying, look, you're, you're trying to look back at the same time as plowing forward. And you can't do that. You can't put your hand to the plow and follow Jesus, but not look at where you're, where you're going, right? Now, if you're really trying to plow a straight row, you're looking forward and you're picking a spot to aim for so that as you're plowing through, you make a straight row for your, for your planting, right? So you need to have a fixed gaze. Just like Jesus has his eyes fixed on Jerusalem, we need to have our eyes fixed on Christ. And you can't try to plow and, and think about all the stuff behind you, you miss. Think of Lot's wife. She just had these things in her heart she wanted. Steve, I saw him. Well, you, you mentioned it, but I just wanted to say a lot more clearly. Yeah. He just burned his method of going back. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there, That's a great way of saying it. No going back. You know, there's no oxen, there's no plow. He, he burned it all up. I mean, in terms of the standard declaration. Yeah. Of, of his commitment to, to mm -hmm. I, thank you. That's that's the best uh, way to sum that up, I think. Whereas this man is, he wants to keep his plow, his oxen, his plan, keep looking back, keep, keep one foot in the door, so to speak, so that if he needs to, he can still change his mind. And what happens, I think, really is kind of interesting because we don't know what these three people chose in the end, do we? I think a lot of times the Gospels do this to us. <laughs> they don't give us resolution. Because as we read it, what they did doesn't matter. It did to them, but it doesn't matter in our lives. And the question is being asked how, if this was our story, what would the next verses be? Then? Would we say, I'll follow you, Jesus? And if the road is rocky and bumpy, and 
I have uncomfortable, uncomfortable parts of my life. If there are times where people don't like me, I'm still going to follow you. I'll do it. I'll do it now. I'm not going to put it off. I'm not going to try to try to entertain the, the things in my life that I feel like are still worldly. And I want to hold on to those while I'm able. And I'm not going to look back. I'm going to keep my eyes fixed on the perfecter, the author and perfecter of our faith. And the reason I think that this is important to um, continue with is that sometimes we just get a bad taste in our mouth. We're like, Lord, why do you make it so hard for us? But I think we have to look through this to the ascension. We have to look through this. This isn't, this isn't going to be drudgery when you follow the Lord. This isn't going to be, man, I wish I had chosen the easier way. I think as we live in the Lord, we realize we have the best life we could ever have. That anyone who would dislike us, as uncomfortable as that is, we'd rather get our, our gratification from the Lord. We'd rather receive our praise from him than from man, right? I think as we go along the route, we're seeing that this is the way to life. This isn't the way to self-death. I mean, sinful death, yes. But to spiritual life, this is the most best journey of all. We're following the Christ. And we're, we're with him. We're following him. We're fixing our eyes on him. And that leads through the valley. But it also it leads to fellowship with the Lord, right? I think of how um, Psalm 23 says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. I mean, we will be fed. We will be nourished. We will be um, filled as we're along this journey. And so following him is not just following him to difficulty, but it's following him to glory. It's following him to, to true happiness, to joy. And I think that's um, what I have to remind myself of. It really is a temptation for me to sometimes look at it like in, in Pilgrim's Progress, you know, some of the, the hard times and you're like, wow, am I supposed to be a sad Christian? And that's not it at all, right? Thanksgiving, joy um, is, is all a part of that. And I think when we know where it leads, that gives us a better sense of that joy. It's much, much easier to have that joy because we see where it's going. I want to pause again for comments or questions and, and see what, what you have. So, so it makes me think of Peter. Well, the, this, the, when Peter was first drawn to Christ, what, what did that? It was a tremendous success in his business. All of a sudden, he has all these fish, right? And then he gets to follow Christ around and he sees that the people were healed and people were fed and all these good things to the point where during the sanctification process of Peter, he wasn't even ready to let Jesus go again, right? He, he wanted to fight back. And then the final time he meets Jesus, again, he gets all these fish, right? And, 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 and so another great success for my business. And then he gets told what the end of his life is going to be about Jesus. And it's not an easy story. And he, in fact, he points to his, his, his brother in Christ and says, well, what about him? And don't we all have the tendency to do that? I, mean, I, I always look at Peter and say, that poor guy who went through such a uh, progressive sanctification process to, in the end, get told that he was going to die a difficult death for his belief. Would, would we, you know, I think, you know, would I be willing to do that? What if I heard that? I'd probably be pretty upset. Anybody else? Just uh, kind of a reminder, I think, that that is a, a, a verse that, that you all know, too, from Hebrews 12. And I'll just read it kind of to finish off. Uh, it's hard to stop when you're reading this passage because <laughs> it just keeps going and going. And there's no, uh, 
easy way to stop. But I'll just read the, the first two verses of Hebrews 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Let's pray. Lord, what a, what a good uh, way to live. What a, what a blessing that is to run this race, putting off anything that would hinder us, Lord. Help us to do that. Forgive our sins too, Lord. We have, we've enjoyed them too much. We've stopped on this race to sin. And uh, we pray that you would forgive us. Forgive us for Jesus' sake. And Lord, we... Um, Pray that you would give strength to our strides, that you would, that we would run in the power of the Spirit, that we would run in the words of Scripture, that uh, we would set our eyes on Jesus, and uh, Lord, that we, we too would be where, where he is, that we would be uh, with you and uh, know that glory, keep that glory, that goal set in our minds too. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Eric, I have a third question. Sorry, I wasn't oh. here earlier. You said Christ has come down with COVID. And, and really? it's the second time he's had it. And he's not feeling well at all. So well, let's pause. Let's just let's do that even right now. Yep. Lord, we give you thanks for Sid's life, how uh, we've enjoyed seeing his faith and uh, life over uh, many years. We pray, Lord, that you'd sustain him today, give him strength, uh, help his body to fight uh, COVID. We pray for the Novingers, too, as they um, fight that, too, as well as many others that we know. And uh, we pray, Lord, too, that emotionally and spiritually they would be buoyed up amidst that uh, time. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Take care, Brent. Have a continued blessed Lord's Day. I'm going to end the recording.